Welcome to Accelerate Startup Academy, where we dig deep into practical and tactical advice from some of the best subject matter experts in the tech world. In this episode, I talk with Ramon Frey about the importance of building authentic communities around your products and companies, something both crucial and very difficult these days. This episode is brought to you by Accelerated Startup, everything you needed to know to make your startup dreams come true from idea to product to company. Grab it on Amazon, iBooks, or Audible today and be a better founder tomorrow. If you haven't yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Ramon is the founder of Good People Dinners, a Bay Area community focused on meaningful conversations, usually over food and drink. These dinners, corporate salons, overnights, and retreats bring together professional chefs and thoughtful speakers on a wide range of topics. They've been running for eight years, producing nearly 250 events for organizations including Mozilla, Synapse, and Frog Design. Since we're all stuck with little physical contact these days, I've asked Ramon to share his insights on building genuine communities online and offline. Here is our conversation. Ramon, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Vitaly. So let's dive right into it. Uh, for our audience of entrepreneurs and investors and everybody related to that, how do you define community? Um, I would define community differently than customers. And I think that's usually where most people need to do a little bit of learning. Um, customers are people who buy something from you. They could be an individual or an organization. Um, a community are, is really an affinity group. It's people who share your interests. Uh, and if you're doing a good job, it's people who actually kind of share some of your values. Those values are really explicitly expressed to them. They click with them. Um, and a, a, a strong community, uh, this is something that I'll sometimes go over with someone sort of right at the beginning of a engagement or relationship. A strong community means that you are wrong for someone. Uh, which is also a kind of a hard thing for a lot of people to get their heads around. You, you can't be all things to all people. You know, Pepsi could spend a billion dollars trying to fold me into their community, and I'm going to be very resistant to that. Uh, but the more you're clear on what kind of values, what kind of interests, what kind of hopes and dreams uh, the people involved are interested in, the more likely you're going to get a depth of engagement uh, that you don't just get from a casual customer. Okay, so uh, thanks for that. That's great. And um, you know, a lot of companies come to you to build uh, communities and use it. They want to use it as a marketing tool, as a commercial tool. Um, for today's brands, what can they expect to gain from these efforts when they actually put their mind to it? Um, I think the the hardest part about building a community that, in some degree, is going to be self sustaining. Uh, you actually have to put that question down. Uh, I think that if you come into a context or you build a context, you build an environment, now people are trying to do it here uh, virtually in Zoom rooms and things like that. If you try to do that in such a way that your agenda or hope for outcome is too obvious, it's going to be heavy handed, uh, ham fisted. It's going to, it's going to bother people. <laughs> Um, so really, you know, if, if you want that higher level of engagement where people are actually having a conversation about the things that matter to your organization, you have to transcend agendas and transactions and you have to empathize. Um, and so in a lot of situations, if you think of this kind of from a marketing perspective, of course, everyone kind of understands if you're, especially if, if you're creating an event, you know, with a beautiful chef and a speaker, the kind that I normally do, you, it, it's understood that there is a networking and marketing component. And the more you can kind of play that down, the more likely you're going to get the right kind of engagement sort of at the top of your funnel. Um, and that means having deep and meaningful conversations. It means creating a context of psychological safety where people open up and and discuss and share and say the things they might not normally say at a standard networking event. 
And so we think through a lot of the specifics of context to put people at ease, to uh, help people feel that this is a safe place where they don't have to come across kind of robotically pushing forward that impregnable, impregnable facade of I'm a perfect professional. And it's, it's still amazing to me how often, especially senior executives, can't snap out of that or struggle to snap out of that, even though the research is really conclusive. If, if you come across as fallible, if you have a sense of humor, if you're comfortable with your own imperfection, if you're comfortable talking about your company's mistakes or missteps with sort of a kind of casual ease, you become relatable. So, uh, you know, our, our standard things have been dinners, but we've done retreats and overnights and uh, always there's somebody representing that company there. And when I'm kind of trying to coach them through being a whole human being so that they're relatable, I say, success tonight isn't that somebody signed a contract. Success tonight is people can relate to you. You were sincere and they want to talk to you. They kind of want to hang out with you by the end of the experience. And so, uh, you know, if, if a person does that, they get, uh, they start to build a real community. Yeah. It's all about building those relationships. Uh, it's very difficult to do these astroturf things. They're popular and maybe somewhat effective in political realm, but probably not in business where you're trying to, uh, really get to know each other. Um, so, if we zoom out a little bit, uh, who do you take inspiration from, you know, big brands that we know out there? Who's doing it best? Um, you know, when I think about that question, first of all, I mean, to go back a little bit to the previous question, what you're really trying to build, and it's very hard to measure. So a lot of marketers today like to measure everything. You're trying to build trust and rapport. And when that trust and rapport is built up, there's less resistance to all kinds of contracts. There's less resistance to having a good business relationship. So when I think of that, one of the uh, marketers who's worked on campaigns for most of the major technology brands that you know, including Apple, he was an employee at Apple, uh, is Seth Godin. Uh, and if you look him up and you, and you watch some of his talks, I recently went to, uh, maybe a year and a half ago now, I went to a conference and I was able to sit with him at lunch he really professes something called permission marketing, or some people might think of it as opt-in marketing. And these are contexts where the exuberance and the enthusiasm for the context are heightened and the narrow kind of linear uh, objectives are diminished, right? So, so many times when we come together in a business context, we're like, the, the reason we have persuaded you to show up here is because we're all trying to get to this place. And ironically, the more narrow and linear that flow, the more awkward the social chemistry. So Seth talks a lot about, um, it's, it's really like, I, I, I guess to contrast it, the other end of the spectrum would be what I would call inadequacy marketing. And that's where you're doing something where you're attempting to kind of make a person feel as though their life is empty or incomplete if they don't have whatever your product or service is. Uh, conversely, what Seth does is harder, but I think, it, again, coming back to community, it builds community. And so what he does is essentially communicate or build campaigns for companies that communicate you're fine, you're great, you're wonderful, exactly as you are, and I'm incredibly excited about, you know, this. Can I tell you about it? Uh, and then I'll give you one concrete example I saw the other day. Everyone's trying to adapt right now to virtual gatherings. And if I have to be honest to you, with you, they, uh, they kind of suck. I, I, you know, if I spend all day on Zoom meetings, <laughs> I feel, burnt out, grumpy, a little tired. Uh, but I'm very curious to see who's doing it right. And Google continues to create and give away to the general public in this wonderful way, although there's, there's obviously people in the audience, they, they give away these fascinating talks. Um, and I watched one the other day 
uh, where it was the paleontologist who was the inspiration for the chief scientist in the Jurassic Park movies. And he was talking about transforming chickens into dinosaurs by reverse, by switching on and off certain genes. Um, and he was talking about the possibility of reviving extinct species and things like this. So ostensibly, this has nothing to do with Google's core business. Google's core business is, last time I looked, I think 96% of their revenue is still advertising. Uh, but it is great at exuberance, curiosity, and engagement. And the, the woman who interviewed him did a, a, a really fantastic job. So I, I think that's an example. You know, another example, I, I, I always recommend people uh, have a look. There's an author and a thinker. Her name is Priya Parker. And she wrote a book called The Art of Gathering, which is a, a good first place to look in terms of understanding a few of the fundamentals um, of how to create social chemistry, create places of psychological and emotional safety so that people can really drop in with each other and connect in a way that kind of lasts. Uh, and so she's also like me, she, uh, we, we've talked a few times, she's also like me looking right now for those rare corners of the web where you can do what you and I are doing right now, and it's uh, rich and not just kind of transactional. Yeah, I got you. And that's that's uh, it's really fascinating. I mean, it's uh, that's some good nuance, and you you've kind of set it up well. It's it's better. Uh, it's much easier now to understand kind of context and how this is supposed to feel on the intent here to truly build. You know, what what does community building really mean? Um, so let's get tactical for a second. Let's say you're starting with a new company, new organization. Where do you begin? What are some of the tactics to kind of take us through the planning process, how this falls into the marketing mix, how companies, organizations should really be thinking about this? Uh, you know, the, the, the first thing that I would do with any company that was interested in uh, building community, whether it's uh, in real life events or, you know, off the grid, for instance, here in the Bay Area does a wonderful job. They can just show up and feed 100 people anywhere. Amazing food. They're really good at sort of drop and drag high level cuisine. Um, but I would go in and I would say, tell me about your community now. Tell me about what you wish it could be or where you feel you're falling short. How much do you know about your community as you, that you're working with right now? And how do you know that? Uh, what has the community itself, have you ever sent out any surveys? What has the community itself told you it wants to learn about, see? What is that aspirational version of the interaction with your brand? And so we get into this conversation. A, a good example of this would be uh, years ago, my first corporate client for GP Dinners was Mozilla. And my friend uh, Yasha Kaikus Wolf was the chief marketing officer there at the time. And so he had been coming to my events actually for probably like two years at that point, my own independently produced events, and had even hosted, we'd even put together some fun things at his home. Uh, here and there. And he said, could you do this for Mozilla? And we, we started talking about it. And then he just brought me in and I had the, the, the really the pleasure of a two hour kind of open-ended Q and A and conversation where I facilitated and I, I ended up filling like three or four giant whiteboards with what mattered to that company. And that company had just hired its first chief innovation officer and their their goal was very clear. They had surmised that like any large organization that's very software engineering focused, uh, and, and I, anecdotally, I can say this is true for every large organization, especially when you have really smart, competent people involved, it becomes insular. So no matter how intelligent or capable it is, the ideas start to circulate, you know, like, like when you recirculate the air in your car. And so it becomes less and less likely that you're gonna have any kind of creative breakthrough. And so Mozilla was very clear. We, we know that you know fascinating and diverse people from all kinds of professions. And so we got into a, a conversation about creativity theory. Uh, 
And they said, we're going to pay for, uh, it ended up being, the first engagement was four dinners, and then we ended up doing about 16 events together. We're going to pay for that, and we want you to invite the most interesting people you know, as diverse as possible. In fact, what we're not looking for is more people very similar to sort of our Mozilla engineers. And so they paid for this sequence. There were 40 people at each event. I MC, we always had a fascinating speaker and a chef and a wine sponsor. And I like to work with very unusual venues. And uh, the, the hope was Creative Collision. So I, I have a tendency to recommend books also in those kind of brainstorming sessions. So I gave them a few books on creativity theory. A few that come to mind are like Creativity Incorporated, which recently came out by Ed Catmull, the co-founder of Pixar. Uh, Little Bets by Peter Sims is excellent. Um, Where Good Ideas Come From by Steven Johnson. Those are all good books. Richard Floyd is a wonderful writer on creativity. Those are all good books for you to get a general grasp of creating that chemistry of psychological safety, diverse interests, diverse expertise, removing the pushing of agendas and allowing kind of this magical chemistry to take shape. And it, it often, honestly, it's, there's a concept called oblique thinking, which I wrote about recently, where, you know, if you were a genius, if you're Einstein, and you're focused on a particular set of sort of physics equations, relentlessly, you get stuck. You get stuck and, and you are a victim of your exceptional training and knowledge. And so really great creatives, you know, like Einstein or Newton or Marie Curie or all kinds of uh, writers uh, will know, they'll know that feeling. They'll be like, I'm stuck. I'm just repeating myself or I'm stuck in this group of people. Everyone's super smart and all we're doing is repeating shit. Uh, I need to go for a walk. I need to read some fiction. I need to watch a movie. I need to go for a hike. And, you know, there's actually pretty good research now that suggests by turning your focus in your mind uh, to something more gentle or turning to something completely different, there are subconscious layers of cogitation that are working through those problems. And when they get to the right place, they will surface them for you and you'll have a better idea. So that's that's kind of where we arrived with Mozilla, and it was a, a wonderful series that unfolded over about a year and a half. Um, since then, I've probably worked with, I don't know, 20 or 30 other companies in varying capacities, sometimes just as an advisor and sometimes actually creating events for them. That's great. I think you just described also the beginner's mind um, theory or whatever you want to call it, and why startup founders are able to break through and usually a lot younger than the big companies that they're disrupting in general. So uh, I see some parallels there. So uh, you, do a lot, you, know, you do a lot of, you know, you described a lot of these events that are dinners, that are close quarters. Obviously we're a slightly different moment in time right now with pandemic for the last few months and everybody, you know, being able to uh, just sit at home um, and everything sh shut down. It's a big problem. I can imagine this has certainly affected your practice, but um, when we return to normal, uh, what do you think the conferences and events are going to feel like? Um, Web Summit just announced that they're going forward uh, in Lisbon, whenever that is later this year. Um, and I saw all sorts of varying degrees of celebrations and, and people being pretty pissed off about <laughs> what that means for health. So what changes do you expect are going to be permanent? Yeah, how, do you, how do you think we're going to change going forward with these types of events? That's a great question. I, you know, you know, I'm always a little, a little uh, r resistant to crystal balling. There's so many unpredictable things. We, you know, who knows when we, we might get a vaccine, and this is no longer a concern, or what if this virus mutates and there's several virulent strains? If 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 it mutated and there's a more aggressive strain, which is exactly what happened in 1918. You know, you will see all of these things get completely pulled the plug immediately. Nobody will want that liability. Um, but it's also possible that things could get a lot safer. You know, macro trends, smaller gatherings. And I think there's, that's just kind of a result of epidemiology. <laughs> uh, gathering together outside, smaller groups, uh, 
all of those things, those are the kinds of events that I'm thinking about producing as we come out of this. I'm thinking about getting a country property. Um, it's nice sometimes to pull people out of the, the rush that everyone was in and get them to slow down and become more contemplative together. Usually that produces some really interesting breakthroughs. Um, you know, as far as online events, I went to a lot, I ran a few, the best of them really felt quite mediocre. Even though I got some feedback from people, they really appreciated my attempt to sort of translate what we'd been doing to a, a Zoom room. We had like a, a dinner basically with 60 people and a speaker. Uh, but the, the organization that has most impressed me so far, and it's because of the creative love of it, is... Uh, an artist collective that feels very much like Burning Man called the Co-Reality Collective. And I know this sounds like a tangent, but I, I will bring it around. They have put together mermaids and circus performers and all, you know, graphic designers and serious software coders. They got one of the people at the heart of it is a very su successful technology entrepreneur. Uh, he's the guy who, who trained uh, Jonathan Safran for, I think, to do memory palaces for that book, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein. He's got like a photographic memory. And this group is spending hundreds of hours of cumulative effort designing entire virtual environments every two weeks with a new website and everything where you can drop into secret rooms and each of them has a theme and the whole party has a theme. And it's mostly people in the UK and people in San Francisco and I see something really special in this group. Uh, my, my romantic partner, Karen, she's involved with planning these things. I see something really special there. I sent it toward, to Priya Parker, who I mentioned before. I think groups like this coming out of the pandemic are going to become legit companies if they want to uh, and are going to provide one plus one equals three experiences in virtual environments. Uh, if uh, I think for most companies, when they go fully uh, distributed work from home, which a lot are, Twitter just said it was gonna do that. When companies do that, they a lot is lost. They, they, the, I think a lot is diminished. They really haven't figured out how to create that uh, one plus one equals three equation for working from home and having a globally distributed organization. There's one company that has, it's Matt Mullenweg and Automatic, and he did a wonderful interview recently on Sam Harris's podcast uh, where he talked about all the things you can do with a fully distributed workforce that are impossible if you have an office space. So in a similar way, I think for the future of events and community building, it's going to be organizations like the Co-Reality Collective who are going to do completely new things in virtual environments, some of which will require uh, uh, you know, immersive tech and some won't, that will, will really be the future, I think, of the, of the industry. That, that was my thought, you know, as you were describing this uh, VR takeoff that was a little bit over its skis a few years ago, uh, which wasn't the first time VR was a little bit ahead. Uh, yeah. But maybe this will be an inflection point for VR experiences. Uh, I've certainly seen, you know, I'm following, I'm a big uh, racing fan, and I've seen MotoGP, Formula One, Formula E all switch to sim racing which is pretty incredible to see, um, you know, uh, it's definitely not as engaging, honestly, um, but uh, it, it's it's something interesting, something new. I'm, I'm wondering if we're gonna go towards this kind of future of, of living in virtual worlds that uh, were portrayed in Hollywood for the last 20 years. Yeah, I, I think what you're describing has accelerated, right? The pandemic has yes. just accelerated all of that. Uh, and I, you, you, you mentioned at one point, maybe it was before we started talking uh, here in the recording, but uh, about bang for buck. When you think about travel budgets, hotels, mm -hmm. and flights, yeah. when you think about the environmental impact, when you think about all of these things, when you think about time away from your families, when I think about how many professional friends of mine uh, ostensibly lived here in the Bay Area and were like never here, and now they got a break and they don't want, they yeah. don't want to go back to that right yeah. <laughs> i i think all of these different variables are converging on something you know another thing that i've thought for years I, i'm just going to say it we 
we have a kind of fetish at these big events for boring old white dudes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that's going to end. I think yeah, the yeah. combination of all these protests, which is healthy. My friend uh, Adam Smiley Poswalski is uh, on the speaker circuit always. And, and uh, more power to him. He's been fighting hard for gender and ethnic diversity on the speaker circuit for a long time, getting more interesting, more provocative and younger speakers and diverse speakers. I think we're going to see more of that because, you know, some of the least compelling people I've ever seen on stage are some of the most successful. Right. I, why would you do that? Why would you spend 80 or 100 grand on somebody where half the audience is asleep? Right. When, well, when you, they, they're successful as in business, but that doesn't really translate to them performing on stage because right. that's what you really do. You and I both do a lot of speaking on stages and that's a different muscle, different set of muscles that you need to use to actually deliver the information in an engaging way. Yeah. I and absolutely have, agree some, with you. yeah. have some disagreements. I mean, so many yeah. of these panels, I'm happy to disagree with you on stage. I know there's right. stuff to disagree. Yeah, right. We're yeah. doing the audience a service. I, I, I have so much respect for you, but Let's really disagree. Yeah, yeah. Nothing more boring than I agree with my fellow panelists. Oh, there. Right. Every like panels of consensus, like shoot me. You know, and another yeah. format that I think is really interesting is the unconference. There was one happening in Palm Springs every year, the Yes and Yes Yes conference was what I've it was called. Yeah. So they're the they were the big pioneers of the unconference, and that's where we all yeah. show up, and uh, we you know you and I walk up to the let's do a panel on uh, pangolins. And we right outside the room, this panel is all about the pangolin mm -hmm. and we have a zoologist and we see if people show up and if they don't, it switches. They're, they're just really interesting formats. Google did a, a, a top secret kind of conference like that, that my, my partner, my girlfriend worked on last year. It's invitation only. It's very high. Everyone there is brilliant as hell. There were like 300 people. I couldn't even get in. I was willing to pour drinks. I couldn't even get in. Um, and they did that. They did an unconference style where the, the, the people attending actually pick spontaneously yeah. the topics to discuss. Well, I think uh, this format works really well when the intent of the event is to build the community, not showcase your advertisers essentially on stage. Yes. So yeah. That, yeah. that's kind of gotten old. Yeah, I activate, mean, I think activate your audience. Yeah, Don't exactly. let them just sit there and then and then create context where they can interact. You know, yeah. you walk out of one of these rooms with a bunch of sage on the stage and they say, get lost. You right. should walk out of that auditorium to an environment where there's a facilitated discussion. So all of that curiosity you had and excitement you had for what they were talking about can turn into an interaction with the people around you. Yeah, I, I, I think we should really rename a lot of these big conferences to tech, uh, tech concerts. <laughs> with, uh, you know, somebody performing on stage, somebody famous. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, really, it's gotten to a point where for the last few years, I've actually refused to do panels. I, I don't really see them as valuable, you know, flying somewhere for 20 hours and time zones and this and that just to sit on stage and speak for five minutes answering kind of silly questions and, you know, doesn't add much value. And uh, I think, you know, CES, uh, Web Summit, all these big events with tens and tens of thousands of people, Mobile World Congress, I think 2019 was the biggest they'll ever be. So I'm, so I'm very, yeah, I'm very curious to see what happens next. I, I don't know anyone who's genuinely excited to go to CES, right? right. They're all like, I got to do it. I got to do it. We got yeah. a new thing. We're going to roll it out. I have to, yeah. but I, boy, would I rather pretty much do anything else. I think about where I met you, actually, I met you on a train going into Davos at the world, yeah, Economic, exactly. at the world economic forum. And those were all my best conversations there. It yeah. wasn't when I was up on stage moderating a panel. My best conversations were like with you and that professor from Berkeley, and we're all just hanging out on the train. We all yeah. find out we're from the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah, that was that was uh, that was fascinating uh, to kind of go so far to meet people that were next door to. Yeah, but it was good. It was the right context, I think. So um, I have to ask, you know, tell me, tell me your favorite war story. Let's make it nice and juicy. Um, <laughs> you, you've seen a lot, and uh, I think I think there's some value there. The things that have been the hardest, I've kept one foot in the technology startup founders world, as well as in the community building world. One of those opportunities, I went very quickly from hired as a consultant and advisor to offered the chief marketing officer role 
uh, to we grew we we just hit that inflection point perfectly. We raised all this money. Uh, there was now a parent company, and I was a founding partner in that parent company with a significant amount of equity. The parent company was a benefit corporation focused on uh, environmental, social, and governance impact. So I got to ride one of the startups that was uh, saw explosive growth <laughs> and the opposite. And that was full of difficult lessons for me. And I think I will carry some, I think a little bit of cynicism from that for the rest of my life. There, there, there are people who are almost exclusively without integrity and will do anything for a buck. And some of those fail and some of those succeed. I, I find it a very demotivating context when I have to work with people like that in any way. And then there are some people who have those deeply powerful reality distortion fields who are saying all of the humanistic and altruistic things that my heart has always yearned to hear uh, about really substantively, foundationally making the world a better place. And so to build community for a company like that is a dream come true uh, for me or anyone else. And I'm involved right now with three different companies uh, to varying degrees uh, because I had to reinvent. We're not doing any live events at the moment. Uh, the, one of those painful lessons is a lot of those people don't even have any self-awareness about being full of shit. And that was, that's hard to be so, so inspired by someone to see so much go well and to see it all fall apart because there wasn't integrity there. Because when, the, when, when things did go difficult, there was no commitment there. They were just saying whatever came to mind. And so uh, I learned a very valuable lesson that really summarized, frankly, in my friend Safi Bacall's book called Loon Shots. He has some terminology for this. He says every organization needs, he calls them artists and soldiers, and they need a dynamic equilibrium most organizations are dominated by creatives or dominated by people who are about incremental improvement and execution. And there's often tension or even resentment or a lack of respect between those two. And so, you know, war stories, all, I, I have failed so many times in startups. I've just always tried to learn the lesson. And, and the lesson's very much in that book, Loon Shots, where you, you need to, you, you, you act kind of like a gardener in the middle if you're part of the founding team you make sure everyone is empowered and you go out of your way to cultivate reciprocal respect and healthy communication between those two groups. And that can actually be a function of community as well, because everybody needs inspiration and, and some connection to the outside world, to customers, to vendors, and to people who simply admire your company can be a, a powerful fuel to keep, keep both the soldiers and the artists kind of in motion. That's fantastic. I think if people follow that advice and kind of take a mirror to themselves and to their organization, they're going to realize a lot. So uh, kind of rounding the corner here, uh, and, the, and the last question that I like to ask, um, you know, you're a subject matter expert, you've been doing this for years. Uh, what is kind of the most important thing about building communities that's uh, non-obvious that you think people should understand? The most successful community you build will be constantly resistant to measurement. And, and that's where a lot of companies start to get into a, an internal struggle. When you find someone who creates that exuberant, enthusiastic engagement and energy, trust them, empower them, do whatever you can. And this is really hard because you're always looking to cut budget. And if you're looking to cut budget from one thing, it's probably marketing and community building. But if you go into a room and everyone's lit up, that is lightning in a bottle. That is magical and rare. Most community events are expensive and suck, and people can't wait to go home and turn on Netflix. And and, and that's that's a difficult one to measure. I mean, the, the, way, the way that a lot of companies do measure it is, you know, oh, look at all these leads that came about as a result of people who were introduced to, and it turned into a couple million bucks of sales, which is, 
often true. And, and so the, the spend was a no brainer, but I, I really encourage people to think a little more long-term and to pay attention to the feeling in the room. You know, to go back to one of your earlier questions, when I would initially engage with a company and they, and we would try to say like, what do you want to happen in community? Part of that is how do you want people to feel after they engage? After you've brought people together, whether it's virtually here or in the real world, how do you want them to feel? And that is completely neglected. I don't think we spend enough time on that. You know, if I, if I could have an infinite budget and assemble my dream marketing team, there would definitely be SEO, there'd definitely be, uh, but it would also have people who would have that emotional intelligence, that EQ training, that EQ awareness. And it's, it's, it's infinitely powerful when someone can create context that make people feel very strongly in any particular way. You know, the, the rule is indifference, really, and, and, and that's, that's much easier. Yeah, that's wonderful. So, I mean, I, that's, that's really the key there is the, uh, the emotion that you're trying to create that you can't really quantify. Uh, and that's really what you're measuring the success of the event and the overall community that you're building. So that's what I got out of that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your expertise and your willingness to share your insights. Um, I think we had a very insightful conversation and I think it'll bring a lot of value to, uh, to folks around. So, Again, thank you very much for being on the show and uh, good luck getting through the rest of this adventure. Yeah, you too. Thank you for having me on. It was fun. Thanks for checking out this episode of Accelerated Startup Academy. Hit the subscribe button, leave us a five-star review and tell your friends. If you'd like to connect, reach out to me at golem.net and you can find Ramon Frey at ramonfrey.com.